loser franchises, Tony. Overtime game winner to clinch a series and get to the final. Artori Lekkinen straight to Colorado legend. I mean, this is his move. Lekkinen does this. And then, of course, Don Koharski's commentary. Oh, holy <laughs> oh, sorry. Yep, that's now Colorado lore. And then the two multi-goal comebacks they had earlier. Seems like destiny for the Avalanche. And touching the Clarence Campbell Bowl. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. The Colorado Avalanche sweeping Edmonton out of the rink and on to the Stanley Cup final. Tim Kalashaw, what was this Avalanche? Avalanche. This avalanche is 12 and 2 in the playoffs. This avalanche is a, the first team in 21 years for Colorado to get to the final since the Ray Bork uh, victory yeah. tour year in 2001. And, and, and enough has been said about their offense, or I should say, you can't say enough about their offense. You can't stop them. Edmonton had two different two goal leads, and you could never feel comfortable. But in the middle two games of this series, Edmonton scored two goals. So Colorado is capable of shutting down the high, the highest scoring, you know, high octane offense in the league. That's why I think even with the goaltending disparity moving forward, they will be the favorites to beat whoever comes out of the. But you don't even know who they're going to play, but they're the favorites. Tim no, Kalashaw no. says George Sedano this run for the Western Conference. Tony, this avalanche is a snowball that's been running down and getting steam for years. This is a culmination of the last several years, if you look Do at snowballs it. Want they're, steam? They're only I don't the think they want Steve. I think they, I think they want to go the other way, but that's okay. Okay, well, they're, all, they're only the seventh team uh, in the sports history to go from a 300 winning percentage to the mm -hmm. Stanley Cup final in a span of five years. And by the way, they've done it twice now. And, and, you know, they're one of two teams that have done it in the last eight or four teams that have done it in the last 80 years. So, look, they, they are certainly a team that when you look at them, it's funny. I watch the West versus the East, and it feels like I'm watching a video game that's playing in, like, pro mode versus, like, novice mode because it's so easy for what they're doing out West when they're, when they're scoring. And, look, for Edmonton, I want to take a second to acknowledge Edmonton, which, look, by all accounts, has been a fantastic season for them. But one has to look at what uh, McDavid did and Dreisaitl did both scoring over 30 points in one postseason and lament at least a little bit because they'll only be the second team back since the 1983 Bruins to not make the Stanley Cup final in an event like that. So a lamentation from George Sedano. Is there a Gutierrez on this avalanche run? Yeah, it also just goes to show you their depth, the way they can win. They didn't have Kadri in this one. He was out with a thumb injury. No problem. They're playing with a backup goalie. No problem. And, you know, the third team in 30 years to sweep a couple of series before the Stanley Cup final. And both of those teams won it all. Mm -hmm. So you look at this Avalanche team and you think they can seem to win in any different number of ways. Edmonton had the most goals and the most goals against coming into this series. And, well, they won different ways. They could shut them out or they could outscore you. And so I just don't see anything in particular that, av that the Avalanche can do where you can look at the Avalanche and say, hey, this is their obvious weak spot. This is where you beat them. It seems like they can win any number of ways. Mm -hmm. Harry Lyles Jr. Yeah, Tony, before I heap praise on the Avalanche, I want to shout out Leon Drysall just because I think any of us watching that game last night felt for him for trying to do his best Willis Reed impression. Like, that really was just incredible watching him tough that out. Him and Connor McDavid are going to be a problem in this league for many years to come. Uh, as far as the Avalanche go, I think they have to feel great about where they're at right now in the postseason. They've got eight come from behind wins this postseason. It is the most that they've had in franchise history. The last time they did that was 1996, and they won the cup that year, too. Touching or not touching the conference final trophy. It's a superstition, maybe, that turned into a tradition, maybe. But maybe it kind of robs you of a great achievement, too, because the Avalanche did touch it. There seemingly was some negotiation before it. Did they get too far in touching it, Tim? <laughs> Does anybody have a record of showing that touching leads to losing the Stanley Harry, Cup? Harry, Harry, Harry's right. raising his hand. He seemed to know the stack. Go ahead, Harry. What do you got? 10 and 6 since 2000. If you touch it, you're 10 and 6. Look at Harry Lyles doing. You're doing the research. Wow. Kalashaw, you walked right into that. Touching. All right. Israel, any, any, any ruling on touching it here? Oh, uh, yeah, no, I'm with George, and he said before the, the, the show started, uh, superstitions are for loser franchises. You don't have to worry about that. In fact, I would touch it. I would be all over it just to show everybody, hey, I'm not scared of ridiculous superstitions. All right, then we'll let that be the last word. We'll move on. Showed uh, another story I want to get your take on here, and it is from the Live Tour. Speaking personally, I really feel like, you know, golf's a force of good in the world. How is that journey 
helping the women oppressed in Saudi Arabia, the migrant groups, their rights violated, the LGBTQ individuals who were criminalized, the families of the 81 men who were executed in March, and those being bombed in Yemen. <laughs> it's a really hard question to answer. You know, we're just, we're just here to focus on the Gulf and, and kind of, you know, what it, what it does globally for, you know, for you know, the role models that these guys are and that we are. And uh, yeah, that's a really hard question to get into. That was today, 36 hours from first ball of the new golf tour. Golf is a force for good is how Graham McDowell started there with all eyes on how or if golfers address the follow-up question asked by Rob Harris there. Meanwhile, Greg Norman, who's running this tour for all intents and purposes, said Tiger Woods was offered high nine figures to join. And with Phil Mickelson's announcement that he's playing and Dustin Johnson rescinding his PGA Tour membership, it looked like it might be a break point here for all golfers between the PGA Tour and here. But the U.S. Open today announcing those golfers will be allowed to play the U.S. Open as it's a non-PGA Tour event. But Israel, a lot to get to. Do you see golf as a force for good, as a possibility here, as Graham McDowell initially said there? Well, really quick first with Phil Mickelson kind of avoiding the initial surge of media and then just sort of jumping on here, I think is a little cowardly given how much he still has to answer, uh, at least to, you know, a lot of people. But in terms of that, your question, and in terms of just the Graham McDowell comment, like, yes, that is a very difficult question. It is also a question you would think you would have asked yourself before accepting this money to play on this tour. If nothing else, you should have asked yourself and had an answer that would at least placate, you know, the media or whomever, just so you could prepare for this. Everybody here has been saying, hey, this is the best for me and my family. That's great. It's a small group of people who are probably, probably just guessing, doing pretty well right now. And so for you to just say that this is just to help my family, I get that. Everybody's looking out for themselves. But that answer doesn't really tell me that anybody there is looking at the bigger picture. And I don't know if golf can come in and save them and sort of change everybody's mind here. Harry, you did hear an answer from McDowell there, though. It was that we're trying to bring golf to a new market, new people, and use it as a force of good. Do you believe that's a possibility here with this tournament and tour? Not quite, and I don't think it's going to have the staying power just because it feels like, to Izzy's point, it's weird that we had Phil's comments. Those haven't really been answered for, and we still have no answers for similar questions. It just feels like, to me, this is a situation where the people involved have a price that they can be bought for and they said it was good enough and for somebody like that to just sit there take their money and just take the punches i i think that that's what a lot of people have decided to do in the situation if i can ask a follow-up then harry do you see it and and in any way these are individuals doing it whereas well we've seen other leagues we've seen the olympics we've seen the nba in china the nba is about to play uh in abu dhabi this uh, do you see it as different when it's a league versus when it's an individual I, I think ultimately it's it's still the same, uh, but I, I understand just the magnitude of it and why this one might seem different. But to me, ultimately, the things that are at the core here are the same. Tim Kalish, I'll bring you in here. You know, to get to your last point, things like the NBA's relationship with China needs to be examined. But that still, that is very different f from the NBA being entirely funded by China, as if all their money came from there. These guys' money, they know where it comes from. Graham McDowell had no answer for that question because there is no answer for that question. These are money-grabbing money grabbing players, as Roy McIlroy called them. Uh, they, don't, they don't care about that. Phil Mickelson, to Israel, Israel's point, is getting two, uh, reported $200 million to play, and he waited to the last second, so he wasn't included on the list. That was very weak. And I just hope that the PGA Tour's fight with these players doesn't turn them into martyrs of some sense. Uh, because they don't deserve to be viewed that way under any circumstance. And, and George, another a follow up to what Tim just said. Do you view things differently here when it's sports, and, and we're talking about sport washing here, right? The, the term that's been coined recently. When it's doing business in a country versus doing business for a country, and do you believe this is one or the other? Uh, I do, Tony. I think it's different when you're doing business with a country, right? I could see the larger entity at least trying to sell us the pie in the sky of we're going to try to make, you know, bridge some gaps between the way they do business and the way we do business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As an individual, I find that harder to believe personally. Um, this to me just boils down to, and by the way, look, 
I've never been offered $125 million. I've never been offered $200 million, et cetera. But I generally like to live by a rule of I don't make a decision solely based on money. And particularly when it comes to Phil Mickelson, Izzy and, and everyone has already pointed out that he was in, then he was out, and then he's back in. And now he's using um, that he's had some issues with gambling uh, as a vehicle to perhaps maybe shield him from some of the criticism. And I think that needs to be brought up and discussed a little bit as well. That honestly is somewhat understanding to me, uh, at least a little bit. But, you know, when you've got Dustin Johnson out there saying, well, after this, I'll never have to play golf again. I mean, dude, you made $40 million last year. You know, it's not like. But isn't that you know, taking you to jump too far to assume that this was is just from. a decision they're making about money? Tim, I'll bring you back because I asked you about sport washing. But the idea that golf for the force of good could be part of the reasoning here. Well, I just don't see how exactly you're arriving at that. They say they're bringing it to new markets. Uh, most of the tournaments are in the United States. There's nothing new about any of that. And I'm very curious to see what networks and what sponsors are willing to align themselves in any kind of meaningful way where their name is out there on this tour, which is what it's going to need to sustain itself if and it's going to last for a few years. I mean, it's a bunch of, it's a lot of justifications by these players, you know, the U.S. involved with Saudi Arabia, you know, in terms of selling them weapons. I mean, all that stuff, they can justify whatever they can, but really it just comes down to you as a human. And in golf, you are the one who has hearing the questions behind the mic. There's not a whole team of people that are protecting. That, that, so. See, that's why for I'm me, it, it. I, this is not to what about, but that's why for me, it is interesting when a league like the NBA is saying we're going to be in Abu Dhabi. And that question that Paris asked about LGBTQIA, that applies directly to, to it being criminalized in Abu Dhabi as well, right, Israel? Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, if I, I'm not going to be in favor of a tour in which I could literally not go participate in. Zidano, last word. Uh, quickly, just to compartmentalize just the sports part of this, Tony, if you're the a piece of everything in the couch now, uh, how are the Rams doing this all under the salary cap, George? And how big a deal is this big deal? Uh, it's a huge deal because it makes them a championship contender because without him, I don't know if that defense would make, him, make them a championship contender. But I will say this, the accounting works. You're just going to eventually have to pay the piper. They just keep moving the bill down the Tim road. Tim show. There's one team in the NFL that is all in at all times. They've showed us that during the draft. They don't care about those picks. They'll, they'll get veteran players. They'll go get Bobby Wagner. Everybody else would want to embarrass Aaron Donald, make him sweat, make him wait. They paid him his money, and they said, we're going to win it again. Ira Lyles, Jr. Tony, this is a win for both the Rams and for Donald. He has been the best player in the NFL the last five years at least. And this contract proves that he is one of two players to win Defensive Rookie of the Year, multiple first team, all pros, and Defensive Player of the Year multiple times. The other person to do that was Lawrence Taylor. So to me, this is a win for everybody. Israel Gutierrez. Mm. Yeah, because of everything that Harry just said, I believed Aaron Donald 100% when he said he was going to retire, along with the position that he plays, because, A, he deserves to be one of, if not the highest paid player in the league. But, man, that is a difficult position. It's not like you're sitting back there being protected by four or five guys all the time. So I felt, I felt like he thought his entire time, if I don't get the exact bag I want, I'm out of here. It's an easy choice. Buy or sell two? Darvin Ham introduces head coach of the Lakers. Hello, Darvin Ham. Now fix the Los Angeles Lakers. <laughs> In his immediate availability yesterday, George, I mean, this is your account, so I'll, I'll go to you first. He brought up Russell Westbrook and how he believes Russell Westbrook can work on defense and he's going to stay here. And it's not about your feelings. It's about what reality is. And he also believes in Anthony Davis. What you buying? What you selling? I'm buying Darvin Ham, although, Tony, one cannot live on Ham alone. He's going to need Russell Westbrook to actually play defense, which, by the way, he's never been on an all-defensive team. He hasn't played defense since the Pac-12 yeah. when he was the okay, Pac-12 thank you, thank you. player. But hold on a second. We got Woody Page in the body of George Sedano for a second. Man cannot live on Ham alone. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Eh, thumbs down. He's going the wrong way. There you go. All right, Tim Kalisha. If that was a, sh a shot at the ham sandwich, which I have defended many times, I have a problem with that. I have no problem with Darvin Ham. We don't get many Red Raiders uh, in, in the NBA coaching ranks. But here's the thing. R Russell Westbrook's a 30% three-point shooter. Over 14 years, that body of work is there. In today's game, if you're a guard and you can't shoot threes, even when you're not shooting, you're a liability because they know they don't have to guard you. Harry Lyles, Jr. 
Well, I typically don't buy ham this type of year. I usually wait for the holiday season, but I am buying this ham uh, because he said all of the right things that you have to say at your opening press conference. His first job is the Lakers head coach with LeBron James on the team. And the big thing that he said that Russell Westbrook was going to have to do was sacrifice. And that is exactly the thing that you have to say and the thing that you have to try to get him to do in order to have success. Now, is he going to be able to do that? Who knows? Well, I'm asking somebody who might know. I, I, apparently, you don't. It's Drew Gutierrez. How about you? I was going to give my thoughts on him, but I'll just go forward and say that, look, I do think that the idea of making Russell Westbrook into a defensive player who doesn't need the ball um, is great. It's what Lakers fans wanted all year long. But to actually make it happen, I mean, can we really turn Russell Westbrook into Avery Bradley is the question. And I don't think so. And would you want to at $45 million? You know, Russell Westbrook was at the press conference. He walked in right when he was saying all that. Kalisher, you have a controversial opinion here. You think the ham sandwich is the one seed of sandwiches? Oh, is that what you're telling us? The ham sandwich is much maligned compared to turkey and some of the others. And there's nothing better, nothing better than a well-made ham, the right mustard. You can't beat that. Fire cell three, College World Series set Oklahoma, Texas. They'll play tomorrow. Thrilling day yesterday. Four games played. And you know how Oklahoma, well, they came in the the easy big favorite. They lost their first game. They were on the brink of eliminations at UCLA. But how do you come back? 15-0 is how you come back to run roll them out. And then Texas, first unseated team to make the final ever, beating Oklahoma State. It's a Big 12 bonanza, Tim Callishaw. What are you buying and whose run to the final is more fascinating? I got to buy the Longhorns. Texas is unseated, but they were third in the Big 12 behind Oklahoma, the best team in the country year after year, and Oklahoma State, which was was very good. Oklahoma State didn't lose games that they had by more that they had a lead of two runs. They lost the lead, five run lead in this. So you're buying Texas as the more fascinating run. You're yes. not buying Texas the winner. Yes. Harry Lyles Jr. What's the more fascinating run? buying Texas. It has to be Texas. They're the first unseated team to do this. And the way that they did it was impressive. Oklahoma State put up five runs in the first three yeah. innings. They were 29-1 and one whenever they scored five or more runs to come back from that and to do this. And now we have a Red River Championship. That's yes, great. Gutierrez. What's more impressive? The team that has like home field advantage uh, getting, you know, being on top or the team that is Texas is unseated. Hold no on a second. Wait, wait. Oklahoma State, State was on games. the other side there, too. That's a little home field advantage. Let's not make. Whoa, whoa, Israel. How dare you? Okay. But the conversation is why the conversation go before was why was Oklahoma such a favorite? Why are they so they have that home field advantage? And Texas, I mean, 6 0 in elimination games. Like, give me the David in this David and Goliath story every and single George time. Dono. Oh, it's Oklahoma. It shows that they're they're beatable. They they were beaten in a game we never thought that was even possible. It was like our down goes Frazier moment almost there. And then Tom Brady jinxed it by tweeting about it. Texas has beaten Oklahoma earlier this year. But how do you come back? Life's about how you respond. How do they respond? 15-0 run roll. What a force that team is. Woody Harris got passed by Kalashaw and Lyles. Wow, showdown. We don't need any more reports and any more explanations of why we were wrong without any accountability. 30 seconds of FaceTime, Tim Kalashaw. Oh, thank you. I love the NCAA uh, baseball tournament. Congrats to the 16 winners who advanced to the Super Regionals. But a shout out to Texas State closer Tristan Stivers. Led the league in saves this year with 18. They're playing Stanford last night. Elimination game against the number two seed in the tournament. The Bobcats start Stivers. See what they can get from their closer. How about seven innings? How about eight strikeouts? 101 pitches. Texas State's leading 3-1 to one in the middle of the night. They're three outs away, Tony, from advancing. And Stanford scores three runs and beats them. But a hell of a performance by their closer. I can't wait for your documentary on it. But he's the closer. <laughs> we'll see you guys tomorrow. Well done. Happy Hour is presented by Corona Extra. Please drink responsibly.